this morning. Uh, we are in the resurrection season, and yet every Lord's Day is a celebration of the resurrection. And so I say to you confidently, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Our, our hope and the central uh, feature of our faith. All right, we have lots of announcements here, so get your listening ears turned up and uh, grab a bulletin if you have not yet. Uh, but there are a few of them that are not in the bulletin. I will make note of those in just a moment. But the ones in the bulletin, uh, we're having our CE hour as usual. After the morning service, we'll have a short break and then uh, be in here for the CE hour. Uh, please stick around for that for multiple reasons. One of these is not in the bulletin, uh, but we are having a new member join our church today. And so Kylie Gagno will be joining our church. We get to hear her testimony of salvation and baptism and desire to join our church. And so as a church, we need to vote on her membership after that. So we will, we will do that. Uh, so please stick around for that. Wednesday is a prayer meeting, uh, 630 to 730. We'd love to have every one of you with us as we uh, petition our great God to meet our great needs. Um, and then be thinking, we're getting close, we have a Good Friday service planned on the 15th of April, as well as Resurrection Sunday uh, service as well on the 17th. So please make plans to be there, and if you know of someone who does not yet hope in Christ and needs to hear the gospel, then please invite them and bring them everything short of knocking them out and dragging them would be acceptable. Just kidding on that part, okay? Um, two other uh, meeting. Uh, there are ones meeting. Announcements. Uh, first is on April 24th, we will have our quarterly business meeting uh, for the month of April. So uh, plan to be here. We'll have that during the CE hour, and we'll have a potluck uh, before that as well. So uh, plan for April 24th here. We will, we will um, have our quarterly business meeting and a potluck lunch together. And then, exciting, exciting, abounding news, we have our baptism date scheduled. And we have uh, candidates for baptism. It's going to be May 1st, the Sunday after our quarterly business meeting. Uh, we will be uh, having it up at uh, First Baptist Church of St. Francis, uh, where we did our last baptism. And it will be, a, uh, it'll be an afternoon uh, service and ceremony because they have, they're using the facility morning and evening. Okay? But they have graciously uh, offered to... Let us use their facilities again, and they worked out great last time, so looking forward to that. Uh, you will want to be there, I assure you. So please make plans. Um, more details to come. All right, I think that's it, other than a passel of birthdays and anniversaries coming up, so check your bulletin and wish appropriate people that. All right, Brother Don, would you come for our call to worship? Call to worship today, I'm drawing some ideas from the book of Ezekiel. If you read the book, you'll find that God refers to, talks to Ezekiel and says, son of man, son of man, constantly. Also, he uses another phrase uh, talking about the glory of God. He mentions that pretty strong in the middle of it. And then scattered through the entire book is, ye shall know that I am God over and over and over because they are in the land of Babylon. They're in the area where they've uh, been disciplined by God because of all their sin, and he's simply driving it home. You shall know that I am God. Every time you come to a service and you hear the word preach, in a sense, you should recognize the fact that God, the Spirit of God is talking to you. I am God. Listen to me. Let's pray. Gracious Father, <clears throat> We thank you that you give us different types of scriptures and different ways of writing for these different men. We thank you, Father, that uh, we can look at this portion of scripture and sense that you're talking to us as Son of Man and glorifying yourself and then making us to know you in a special way. I pray, Father, today as we each worship together and we uh, listen to the words being preached, that, Father, you might put in our hearts the fact that we have met you and we know you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Don. For our first hymn this morning, take your insert out of your bulletin 
and you open it up. We've got a full page ad this morning on the, on the inside there is His Be the Victor's Name. Uh, we'll sing all five verses. If you're able and willing, stand with me as we sing His Be the Victor's Name. For our corporate responsive reading, take your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. If you don't have an ESV copy of the Bible, you can grab one out of the pew rack in front of you just so we're all reading the same words. It's Deuteronomy chapter 7. That's page 152 if you're using the pew Bible in front of you. Actually, 151. It starts at the bottom there. 151. Deuteronomy chapter 7, we'll read the, f- the first 10 verses together. I'll read the first the odd verses, the congregation will read the even verses, but we'll all read verse 10, the final verse, together. Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 through 10. Let's read together. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mighty than you. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For the, oops. <clears throat> but thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. It was not because you are more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. The word of the Lord. Take your hymnals now at this point and turn to hymn number 54. Hymn number 54, My Lord, I Did Not Choose You. We'll sing both verses together. Hymn number 54.
Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, we'll wait upon our ushers for the morning offering. And just by a little way of preview, as Mr. Deal comes to share the Old Testament and New Testament reading, and will be going through a genealogy today, so pray for him during the offering. But know that each one of these words are inspired by our God. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you are God. There is none like you. You are a God of grace and mercy, and you have chosen to set your, your love and, aff- and affection on sinners like us. We are not worthy. We do not merit the least bit of your love. And yet, in love, you have poured out your grace and mercy on us through Christ Jesus. We praise you and we worship you, God. We thank you for the limitless blessing you have given us in Christ. And so, Father, we ask that you would take these offerings from us now and use them for for your work to spread a passion for your glory in this part of the world and in all the places where you give us influence. Father, we thank you for the privilege of knowing you. Help us to, to tell others about you. Father, help us. Uh, we pray for our missionaries, the Flinks down in Chile. We ask that you would bless their ministry and their services this day. We pray for uh, a new location for them and a new church work to begin here soon. And Father, we pray for the church in Antifagasta that it would be strengthened and would, would serve you faithfully. Father, we thank you for uh, your, your blessings to us, for sustaining us this week. And Father, we thank you most of all for the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the season in which we celebrate it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Genesis chapter 36. Genesis 36. Most of our reading today in the Old Testament is basically genealogies. You're fine to go through here. It's talking about basically Esau's generations and uh, sons, daughters, multiple wives, all those kinds of things are all worked in, sin problems. Uh, governmental leaders, all those sort of things. I told the pastor, and I, I didn't, in reading, reading this, that I don't speak in tongues. And you'll understand as I get a little further along. All right. Genesis 36, beginning at verse 9. <clears throat> These are the generations of Esau, father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Zir. I'm going to stop there for a second. If you have a mind in your mind the geography of Israel and you know where the Dead Sea is at, take the bottom southeast corner of that and it spreads way out for quite a long ways. That's where this where these people have gone. That's what the land of Seir and a variety of things. They even mentioned a, a name of a river here in a little bit, and they think that's the Euphrates River. So that means it's it's a long stretch away of developing of time and history. All right, these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Zir. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of, the wife of Esau, <coughs> Re- Ruel, the son of Basemeth, and the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatman, 
and Kenez. Timnah was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Ruel, uh, Nehath, Zerah, Shema, Mizah. These are the sons of Basimith, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Oholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, and Esau's wife she bore to Esau, Jeshua, Jalem, and Korah. Still awake? These are the chiefs, chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chiefs, Timon, Omar, Zepho, Kinez, Korah, Getham, and Amalek. These are the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Ada. These are the sons of Ruel, Esau's sons, the chiefs, Nahath, Zerah, Shema, and Mizah. These are the chiefs of Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Basimeth, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Oliabama, Esau's wife. And the chiefs, the chiefs Jehush and Jalem and Korah. These are the chiefs born of Oliabama, the daughter of Hannah, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, that is Edom, and these are their chiefs. Now there's going to be there's doubling up of names here because they're changing from part of the genealogy, also expressing as they are chiefs, meaning kind of governmental rulers of some sort in there. And that's how it all puts together. And by the way, uh, in this reading, Esau had multiple wives, multiple sons, and that's why it gets confusing trying to read it and figure out where it's going. All right, let's keep going in verse 20. These are the sons of Zir, the the Horite. The inhabitants of the land, Lotan, Shobal, Sibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, Dishane. These are the chiefs of the, the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Lo Horai, Heman, and Lotan's sister was Timna. These are the sons of Jobal, Elvin, Manahath, Ebal, Shepho, and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion, Ai, and Ana. He is the, he is the Ana who found the hot springs in the wilderness as he pastured the the donkeys of Zibion, his father. These are the children of Ana, Dishon in Holibama, the daughter of Ana. These are the sons of Dishon, Heban, Eshban, Ithran, and Cheron. These are the sons of Eser, Behan, Zavan, Achan. These are the sons of Dishan, Uz, and Aran. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the chiefs of the Zotan, Shobal, Zibian, Anna, Dishan, Ezer, Dishan. <clears throat> These are the chiefs of the Horites, by chief in the land of Zir. <clears throat> These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom. Before any king reigned over the Israelites, Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, the name of his city being Dinhaba. Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah, of Basra, reigned in his place. Jobab died, and Hushan, the land of, of the land of the Ten Mites, reigned in his place. And Hushan died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who defeated Midian in the country of Moab, reigned in his place, the name of his city being Aphith. And Hadad died. And Samuel <coughs> and Sam Samla of the Misraka reigned in his place. Samuel died, and Shual of Reboth on the, on the Rephades reigned in his place. Shaul died, and Baham Hanan, the son of Achor, reigned in his place. And Baal Hanan, the son of Achbor, died, and had her reigned in his place. The name of his city being Paul. And his wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Madrid, the daughter of Misaba. These are the names of the chiefs of Esau. According to their clans and their dwelling places, by their names, the chiefs Timna, Elva, Jazeth, Holiwama, Elah, Pinyan, Kenaz, Teman, Mizpar, Megdiel, <coughs> 
and Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom. That is Esau, the father of Edom, according to their dwelling places in the land of their possession. Phew. Did you notice that every word is pronounced correctly? <laughs> All right. Turn to uh, Matthew. Matthew, and we're looking at chapter 25. We've been going through the things that the disciples want to know uh, when uh, the Lord was coming back and, and a variety of things. And uh, the end of verse chapter 25 and verse 12, it says, He answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know, for you know neither the day nor the hour, referring to when, when, when the Lord's coming back. Then, to emphasize that idea, he puts the parable of the, of the, of the uh, talents. And uh, it's also the parable of the virgins, or some were late and some, some didn't use their facilities correctly. Anyway, that brings us down to um, chapter 25 and verse 31. Now, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels with him. When I was preparing and reading this, I thought all of the angels with him. Wow, that was one massive spiritual army, so to speak. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick in the prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. Verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you, gave, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did that minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. May God bless his word. Amen. Thank you, Don. If you are thankful that you weren't reading that list of names, make sure you shake his hand afterwards, all right? Um, I have said before that all doctrine is important, but all doctrine is not equally important. Scripture ranks certain doctrine as more important. There's no unimportant doctrine, okay? But we cannot say the same about inspiration. We can't say the whole Bible is inspired, but some parts are more inspired or less inspired. It's all inspired, including these lists of names. Uh, and so when you come to these lists of names in your Bible reading, don't skip over them. Read through them. And pray to God and say, God, help me to understand something. And if anything 
If, if nothing but, help me to understand better my inadequacy of coming to your word, that I don't know it as I ought to. Uh, for Moses writing this down, most of the people in that day would have known all, if not most, of these people on the list and the significance. But let me just point out one of them to you um, there in 36. It says, verse 11, or verse 12, says, Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, uh, Esau's son. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz. Amalek should jump out to you. The people and the descendants of Amalek caused great problems for the children of Israel all throughout, and their cousins, their distant cousins. Amalek and, and Saul's disobedience in response to them led to the downfall of Saul's monarchy and why it lasted only one generation and why God chose David instead to replace him. Uh, these, these names aren't unimportant, and it continues on all the way down through the story of Esther, one of, if not the latest, narratives in the Old Testament. We're still dealing with the descendants of Amalek. So th these are hard portions to go through. Um, but like eating your vegetables when you're a kid, it's good for you. All right? Do it and ask God for help. Thankfully, the Bible doesn't taste like vegetables. Amen and amen. All right. Take your, thank you, Don, for persevering there. Take your hymn books now, if you would, and turn to hymn number 195 for our next hymn, hymn number 195. We will sing, I hear the words of love. We'll sing all five verses. Um, you, you may remain seated as we sing all five verses here of I hear the words of love. Amen. And at this point, we'll have our scripture reading. If you're able and willing, would you stand for the reading of God's word? This morning we'll be reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 through 10, the whole chapter. And in a pew Bible, that's on page 986. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith of God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of re reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, 
whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's look to God in prayer one more time before we dive into this text. Gracious Father, you are our God. You have saved us. You have chosen us. You are going to complete the great work that you have begun. Help us, Father, now to, to revel in the fact of your sovereign love which you pour out on your children. Father, help us to hear the truth of this text as the very words of God. Father, help us to see the beauty that is in the text and appreciate it rightly. Father, give us hearts that love the truth and love you and love pleasing you no matter what the cost. And Father, give us a will pleased to submit to bow the knee and to follow you more faithfully than we have before. Father, help me to speak your word clearly and boldly as I ought to. Father, change us, each one, by your spirit, through your word, and make us into the image of your Son. When this happens, Father, we will be people who rightly and accurately reflect your glory and who have an unquenchable hope. We ask that you would do this, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. When was a time in your life when you were most confident of victory? Or most certain of defeat? It could be the game of Uno you were playing last night or risk if you had an extended period of time. Maybe your, one of your fond memories of your high school or, or uh, childhood sporting endeavors. And did it, did it turn out the way you expected? Or have you known someone who's snatched victory from the jaws of defeat or defeat from the jaws of victory? I do remember one baseball game in college in which we played, we were losing by four runs. We were in the bottom of the seventh inning of a seven-inning game. And we had two outs, and the batter got up, and he swung and missed on three straight pitches. Strike three. Game's over. But you know what? The catcher dropped the ball. So he's allowed to run to first base. So the catcher mildly just picked it up, and all he has to do is throw it to the first baseman, and the game's over. We still lose. He threw it about 75 feet over his first baseman's head, and the bases were loaded, and we cleared the bases. And the next guy came around and scored, and we end up winning the game after we struck out with the final out of the game. Rather surprising turn of events. I remember as a child, as I began to read and, and take interest in, in various times, history was my favorite subject, and I loved reading about the Revolutionary War, and I loved reading about World War II, particularly. And in both of those wars, there were moments very close to the end of the war, where had events gone just slightly the one way or the other, the outcome would have been completely different. Uh, the United States could have lost to Great Britain, and even the Allied forces could have lost Hitler was racing towards getting a nuclear weapon at the end of World War II. Um, had he gotten it, I have no doubt he would have used it. At the very least, it would have drastically altered the events that we see. As I told you last week when I introduced this book, when Paul planted this church in Thessalonica, this was the, the missionary stop where he was the shortest amount of time. And it was so short because he was run out of town. And his host was dragged into court by a mob and forced to bribe his way off, pay a, pay a fee to, to be released. If any church looked doomed to failure, 
this church would have been it. And to be sure, it had signs of, of immaturity, it had signs of a lack of knowledge, but despite all appearances to the contrary, despite all reasonings why this church ought not to thrive and grow, it did. Because the outcome of this church, like the outcome of every card game you play, like the outcome of every battle every military has ever fought, and like the outcome of every event in human history, is completely in the sovereign hands of our God. And as Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, the king's heart is in the hand of Yahweh. He, Yahweh, turns it wherever he will. Or Psalm 15, 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he wills. Actually, that's verse 1, not verse 3. Apologize. So, we have before us a church that succeeded, that thrived, that grew, that was built up, strengthened, and solidified, despite all the odds being stacked against it. And I want to just take a moment, briefly, before we dive into our, our text today, is to address just the greeting there in verse 1. It says this, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. The senders are Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Paul is referencing his missionary team that is with him. Silvanus, all, uh, all the commentaries that I've read agree this is, uh, this is Silas, okay? This is the Latinized version of Silas' name. Okay, we know that in the second, first missionary journey, it was Paul and Barnabas who went out in there, but then uh, there was a, a dispute amongst them that, that couldn't be reconciled at the time, and so Paul, Barnabas went, took John Mark and went one way, and Paul took Silas and went another. Um, and even through that difficult circumstance, uh, God blessed and multiplied and grew and planted churches all throughout the way. And then Timothy uh, is what Paul's son in the faith. He's a uh, he's, uh, son of a mixed marriage. His uh, father is a Greek, his mother is a Jew, and uh, probably in all likelihood his father's an unbeliever, but his mother is a, is a Christian, his grandmother is also. And he comes in the, in the Acts narrative on Paul's missionary journeys, he comes in, Paul meets him in Acts chapter 16. Well, guess where Thessalon Thessalonians comes in? Acts 17, the very next chapter. Uh, so the Thessalonians would have known these three men, and, and Paul is primarily the author, the writing down of it, but he introduces his team as they have served and worked together. The recipients, as we talked about, the church of the Thessalonians. This is not to the city of Thessalonica. It's to the church. The church, the called out ones. The ones who have been, been saved by grace through faith alone. And the authors of this work is God the Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ. This church of Thessalonica is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Incidentally, this is the only place where, where Paul uses the term in God the Father. He uses in Christ a lot. That's a very frequent uh, terminology throughout Paul's writings. Uh, but here he uses the phrase in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They, combined with the Spirit, are the authors of this church. They're the ones who caused it to be born, as we're going to see in our text today. And then finally, he concludes with the greeting, grace to you and peace. Grace and peace. These, there was a, this, is, this follows the, the standard letter format of the ancient Greco-Roman world, but the content here is distinctly Christian. Okay, Grace and peace are the two things that every human being needs more than anything else. We are born enemies, born rebels. We're under the wrath of God. This is going to come out here in this text. It's in our memory verse that we've been memorizing in Ephesians chapter 2. What we need most in our diet, most dire circumstance is the grace of God and peace with God, which 
comes as a result of the grace. So that's the introduction there to the letter. And now I want to get to our proposition here, my proposition of the sermon. And that is this. You must thank God for saving his elect. You must thank God for saving his elect. And I see in our text here three reasons. The first reason is that this is the plan of the Father. The first reason for thanking God for saving his elect. By his elect, I mean the church. I mean every Christian throughout human history. It's the plan of the Father to do so. We'll see that here. The second reason is for the power of the Spirit. It's the power of the Spirit which brings this about. And the third reason why you must thank God for saving his elect in our text today is the promise of the Son. It is the promise of the Son. And we'll look at these three reasons in turn. The first one is the plan of the Father. We see that there in verse 4. But before we get to verse 4, look at verse 2. Paul starts off, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly remembering you in our prayers. Paul loved the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians brought him great joy. He was delighted. He thought of them often, and he prayed for them as frequently. And he then gives reasons for that. He's remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus. There had been a change brought about in these people. It was seen in their work of faith. Now, you may be thinking, maybe some of you kids are remembering our, our verse we just memorized in Ephesians chapter 2, where it says, We are saved by grace through faith alone, and this is not your own doing. It is not a result of works, so that no one should boast. So what is this work of faith? I thought our faith was not of works. It is not. But our faith does work. Getting the faith, obtaining the faith, is a gift of God. Once given to his children, our faith then works not to earn our salvation, not to merit it in any way, but to evidence that the salvation is from God. Therefore, the works, the fruit that come out, are in line with the, the planter, the sower, and the grower of the seed. Our work of faith continues with a labor of love. Right? If, if love is easy, then I would submit to you that you're in that wonderful stage that uh, I think it was Thumper and Bambi, you just called Twitterpated. Okay? Outside of that, love is hard. It's good. It's delightful. It is joyous. But love, Christian love, is, is hard work. It, co- it is costly. And so Paul praises God for their labor of love and finally their steadfastness of hope. They were facing circumstances that some would look at and say, that's hopeless. You should not have hope if your circumstances are what yours are, Thessalonians. But they did, and it stayed. It did not ebb and flow with the weather or their mood or the stock market. Their hope was steadfast. These are the things for which Paul praises God, giving thanks to him for them. And Paul says the first reason for this is the plan of the Father. Now let's go to verse 4. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. God has chosen you. And we see Paul say one thing about this, about this choosing here in this passage, and he says more things about it throughout the book. He says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, he has chosen you. This choosing of God is a loving choosing. God chooses those he loves. All choosing is a selection, 
And when we have to make a choice and we have the ability to do so, right, we choose what we love the most. Sometimes uh, we choose, we, 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 we want option A, and we all, but, and, but it costs $50, and you want op- or you could have option B, which only costs $10. Which do you choose? Whichever love is driving that decision. If your love for the content of option A is supreme, you'll pay the $50. If your love for your wallet or your budget is supreme, you'll choose the second option. But our, our, all of our choices are driven by love, what we love. And God, too, chooses based on his love. It's a loving choice. But also, if you have your Bibles open, look at uh, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. In 12 and 13, it says this of chapter 3, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless at the coming in holiness before our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. We are established by him. Okay, I put the the wrong chapter in my notes. I realized that did not look right. Chapter 2. Let's go to chapter 2. <laughs> chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. There we go. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what as it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. God calls us and changes us progressively. He does it little by little. He doesn't do it all at once. Wouldn't it be nice, if you follow me with this thought experiment, if he saved you and you were suddenly perfected? Then we could live the next 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 years after our conversion in perfect fellowship with God, absent sin, and no sinners with with which to have to deal with. We could go to a perfect church and deal with perfect people. But God, in his wisdom, chose to do it progressively, little by little. He saves us. Our salvation is secure. It's complete. It's guaranteed. But we don't see the fruit of it all at once. We see it little by little. And so there Paul is exhorting and teaching and encouraging and charging them to walk in a manner worthy. Something that grows. Or consider chapter 5, verse 9. It says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's choosing of you is merciful. Those whom God chooses and saves are receive are beneficiaries of his mercy. We are saved from the wrath of God. A theme, a theme excuse me, he's going to re- revisit here in our passage. And then fourthly, of God's choosing, it is surely. Stay in chapter 5 and go down to verse 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a tall request, is it not? He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. The choosing of God, the end to which he chooses his people is sure because it is his work from start to finish. Do we play a part in it? Absolutely. Do we play the decisive part in it? Absolutely not. God is sure. He will surely complete his work in us. This is evidenced 
Secondly, this choosing is evidenced by the object of Paul's gratitude. When Paul is thanking someone, who is he thanking? Look at verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly remembering you in our prayers. And he then lists three things about the Thessalonian church that he is thankful for. And does he thank the Thessalonian church? Thank you, Thessalonians, for listening to our preaching and putting it into practice. Man, you guys warm my heart. No, he thanks God. Because God is the source. Look at chapter 2, verse 13. He says it again. We also, or and we also thank God constantly for this. That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Their acceptance of the gospel as the word of God also was a work of God. How do we know? Paul thanks God for this work, not them. And then third, consider chapter 3, verse 9. He says, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? He's just got done telling them he's thankful that he just got the report from Timothy that they are standing firm. He sent Timothy back because the church was birthed under such adverse circumstances. He was there for so little time. And he is nervous as a father is for his children who got taken away from him too soon. Are you standing firm? Are you believing the doctrine? Have you fended off the wolves? And he sends Timothy. We talked about this last week. He, he willingly gave up one-third of his traveling ministry team just to make sure they were okay. And he gets the report. They are standing firm. They're remembering the gospel. They're walking faithfully. And Paul thanks God for that because it was God's work that brought it about. What if I went up to Brother Tom Gagno and said, uh, Tom, I, I'm really in a pinch here. Could I borrow $500, please? Tom says, Dave, that's a lot of money, but uh, sure. And you know what? Um, it's a gift. You don't have to pay it back. Now, Tom, this is illustrative, not application, okay? Just an illustration. And what if I receive this gift from Tom, this gracious, generous gift, and I walk over to Dave Hill and say, Dave, thank you for this $500 to meet my need. How are you going to feel about that, Tom? <laughs> the magnanimity knows no bounds. You might think the gratitude was a little ill-placed, would you not? Yes. It's how we know this is a work of God, that God is the one who brings this about because that's who Paul thanks for these things. He doesn't go to the Thessalonians and say, good job, boys, good job, girls, you got it. I knew you could do it. I thank you for listening to my preaching and putting it into practice. Now, please listen to the preaching of God's word and put it into practice, okay? That will warm your pastor's heart. But when it happens... I and we must thank God for the work. If you cannot thank God for him choosing to save you as the decisive person in this equation, then I would submit to you that either you do not understand all that Scripture says about salvation and how it works, or you may be too infatuated with your own self and abilities. You cannot give God the glory he deserves for his work in salvation in which you are taking partial credit. And if salvation is a work of God, 98%, and you, 2%, then the glory for such a gift must be divided proportionately. I think I've mentioned this before, 
but I was a fan of the Chicago Bulls growing up, and Michael Jordan, when he came out of retirement the first time, had did not look like the Michael Jordan of old, and everyone's wondering when's he going to look great again, and he did in Madison Square Garden and against, against the Knicks. He scored 55 points, and at the last play of the game, clock's running down, the Bulls are losing by one point. He drives to the lane, and three defenders come and surround him to keep him from scoring the main shot. So he deftly passes off to Bill Weddington, a backup center and largely a bench warmer, who catches the ball right under the basket, and he was seven feet tall, so he dunked the basketball and scored the winning points. And I, I distinctly remember reading the newspaper the next day, and it said, many years from now, Bill Weddington will be telling his children and grandchildren about the time he and Michael Jordan combined for 57 points in which he scored the game-winning basket in Madison Square Garden. And all of that is true. They did combine for 57 points. Granted, Michael Jordan had 55 of those 57. But Bill Weddington was due the glory for his part. Remember, brothers and sisters, what God said in Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am Yahweh. That is my name. My glory I share with no other, nor my praise with carved images. From start to finish, salvation is a work of our choosing, electing God. Thus, the first reason you must thank him for saving his elect is the plan of the Father. The second reason in our text here is the power of the Spirit. We see here the power of the Spirit there in verse 3. Um, he says, remembering, or excuse me, down in verse 9, he says, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception that we had among you and how you turned from God, sorry, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. This change was costly. Everyone in Thessalonica had a religion. Atheists were not in prominence there. Everyone had idols they worshipped, and they were polytheistic. It was okay to have multiple gods, and it was okay if we had a few different gods from time to time. As long as we accept, you accept your God, I accept my God, we'll be good. Why stick out? Why stand out and be different? The Thessalonians refused the worship of the idols. This is what caused, this is a large part of what caused Paul to be run out of town so early. Such was the disturbance. We have a similar religion here in the United States, often referred to as moral relativism. You can worship whatever you want, and I can worship whatever I want. As long as you don't criticize what I worship, I won't criticize what you worship. You can think I'm weird, but you can't think I'm wrong. Whatever makes you happy is okay. Just so long as you're not hurting anybody. But that is not the gift of salvation that Jesus came to bring us. He said, salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. And the work of the Holy Spirit was brought about in power. You see that there in verse 5. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Jesus said when in John 16, his last night with his disciples, that the Holy Spirit, would one of his functions was to be convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And this happened here amongst the, Thessalon the Thessalonians. They 
they switched from going along with the culture and believing the religious milieu of their, of their, their country and their circumstance. Thessalonica was a privileged city. All of, the, all of the citizens born there were granted citizenship. It was a favored city of Rome. And you know, we talked about this is the Pax Romana. And the, the two goals during that time is collect the taxes, keep the peace. Just go along with everyone. Don't stand out. Don't be different. But the Thessalonians did. Look at verse 6. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. They received the word in much affliction. They were persecuted for their faith. What? They were copying the model of Jesus and his apostles. Jesus promised them, John 16, 33, in this world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And all of the apostles from, the, from Acts 3 on faced persecution. And the Thessalonians were no different. Why would they suffer when there's an easier way to live? Why not just burn a pinch of incense to the emperor once or twice a year? Or just, just say, you know, Caesar is Lord a couple of times. You don't have to mean it. Just go along to get along. But they would not. They stood up. They stood out by worshiping Jesus Christ and him alone. And Paul says this was brought about by the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the greatest evidences for God, one of the greatest evidences for the gospel, is the power of a changed life. These Thessalonians were, were idol worshipers, worshiping their happiness, their truth, wherever they could pursue it. And suddenly they became people who worked in, who did a work of faith, who labored in love and had steadfastness of hope. They were followers and imitators of Jesus Christ. This doesn't happen on our own. It is a work of the Spirit. Thus, the first reason you must thank God for saving his elect is the plan of the Father. The second reason is the power of the Spirit. And the third reason in our text today is the promise of the Son. The promise of the Son. Look down at verse, we'll read 9 and 10 together. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned from God, excuse me, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This promise of the Son is first hopeful says they were to wait. They don't have it yet. Jesus has not come back. A question Paul is going to address further in his next book to them. Jesus is not there rewarding them for their faithfulness in person. He's not sitting yet on his throne in Jerusalem ruling the world, ruling it with a rod of iron, meeting out justice and righteousness to the world. They're suffering for obeying Jesus Christ. And they don't throw in the towel. They don't compromise. They don't stay quiet. They don't go back to the idol worship which had characterized their whole lives. They wait. And they wait for Jesus Christ to come back and reward their faith. This is a biblical hope. This is a life-changing hope. This is joyful, in-suffering kind of hope. This hope, like all hopes, is determined by the guarantor of the promise. And who made the promise that he was coming back? Jesus did. And how many promises 
has Jesus broken thus far? Exactly. Zero. He is trustworthy. When he says he's coming back to reward the righteous and to punish the wicked, you can take it to the bank. You can bet your life. You can bank your soul on the fact that he will. But while he delays, you can wait with hope. Secondly, this promise is immortal. It says to wait for his son from heaven. Well, why is Jesus in heaven? Well, first, because he ascended there. Remember, the disciples all saw him from the Mount of Olives go up. And the angels came back and promised he's going to come down the same way you saw him go up with the clouds right back to this mountain, Zechariah 14. And why did he ascend to heaven at that point? Because he had completed the work he was sent to do the first time. And what was that work? To die for our sins and to be raised from the dead to conquer death and sin for all his children. He had completed the work. It was done. And now he cannot die. Death has no mastery over him, and death has no mastery over those who are in Christ. Remember Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus? Your, your brother will rise again. He'll live again. Oh, I know he will at the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, though dead, will not die. Your body, one day, barring the rapture, will experience death. It's certain. The question is, will your soul be immortal because it's in Christ? How certain is the return of Christ? Well, consider, his bride is here. His bride is waiting when he comes back, he will right all wrongs. When he comes back, he will fulfill his every last promise. When he comes back, he will rule the earth. When he comes back, he will bring even more glory to his Father and to himself, which he rightfully deserves. So you tell me, how certain is his coming? You think he wants to come back? Absolutely. This promise is hopeful, it's immortal. And third, we see it's merciful, this promise. Look at the last part of verse 10. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Well, what wrath is this? This is not, brothers and sisters, this is not the suffering that these Thessalonians are, are enduring right now. Suffering for the gospel is not the same thing as the wrath of God. Indeed, suffering for God it is, <clears throat> excuse me, to be joyful. Their suffering came with joy there in verse 6. You received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Remember what James said? My brothers, count it all joy when you face Trials of various kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So our suffering is not the wrath of God. That's actually meant for our good. And this is also not the ordinary, everyday, just wrath of God that are consequences for sin. All right? I told a few of you that uh, I watched a high-speed police chase a couple weeks ago. And after, uh, when it came to an end, the guy had uh, quite a few felonies on his record and a very, very smashed Toyota Prius. Um, so there's natural, they're, they're not natural, there are biblical consequences to our sins that happen. That's not the wrath of God that's being spoken of here. 
This is the wrath of God, capital W. This is the final judgment of God against all of the wickedness in human history. This is the evil ending wrath of God, which is coming. Let me point you just to two verses quickly. Isaiah 13, verse 11. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. This is a final ending wrath of God. Or 2 Thessalonians verses chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. This is the wrath of God known as the Great Tribulation. Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble. And all those who are not in Christ, who are still alive at that point, will go through that. Are you ready to face today the wrath of God? Or maybe a better question, are you one of those who has been spared from the wrath of God? Thus, the first reason that you must thank God for saving his elect is, number one, the plan of the Father. The second reason is the power of the Spirit. And the third reason is the promise of the Son to rescue us from that wrath. So how do we do that here in closing? Look back at Paul's prayer there in verses 2, 3, and 4. We see first that he is mentioning them in his prayers. He takes time to actually pray and thank God. If you want to thank God for his work in your life, take time and talk to him. Make time in your busy day to speak with him, to pray and thank him for the salvation he has given you. Thank him for the salvation of your brothers and sisters here in our church. Thank him for your brothers and sisters throughout the world. Who are your brothers and sisters? Some you have never met. Some you haven't seen for years or decades. But all of whom who have trusted in Christ, put their faith in Christ, all of whom are spared from the wrath to come. He says also, remembering you, verse 3, before our God. He's remembering your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope. Remember these things about your brothers and sisters. Encourage your soul, spirits, by yours and theirs. Work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope. Recount the times where God has brought growth into your life, where you've seen growth in the life of your brother and sister. All right. We're told to read and reread what God has done throughout human history, throughout sacred history in his pages. It's, it's given as an example for us, he tells us, 1 uh, Corinthians uh, 10 and Romans 15. Take time to remember the work that God has done. And the third way, he says, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Know that God has chosen you. Take time to reflect on his sovereign love and grace in your life. Take time to revel in the security of your salvation because he knows his sheep. His sheep follow him and they shall never perish and no one shall pluck them out of my hand, said Jesus. My father who gave them to me is greater than all and no one can pluck them out of my father's hand. As you revel, as you know, the sovereign work of God in your, in your salvation, you will rightly worship and praise him for his electing grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your work in saving sinners like us, unworthy in every regard, incapable of saving ourselves from even one of our sins, let alone a lifetime of them. But Father, we praise you for choosing us, for saving us, for empowering us with your Spirit, and for the hope that we have in your Son, 
Help us to fuel our lives and fuel our faith on these truths for your glory and our joy. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go from here, discussing the, our salvation, to now celebrating the event that procured our salvation, the Lord's Supper, we celebrate the death of Christ. Take your inserts out of your bulletin, and we'll sing Christ Jesus Lay in Death Strong Bands on the back of that page. We'll sing, let's just sing just the first five verses there on the sheet. We'll sing the first five verses there. If you're able and willing, stand with me as we sing Christ Jesus Lay in Death Strong Bands. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, we'll wait on upon our deacons. That's probably one of the easiest transitions from a sermon content to him to the Lord's table. Uh, thankful for God's word and for men and women he inspired to write good poetry about it. We come to hear the Lord's table and we are celebrating here the death of Christ on our behalf. As Martin Luther said it, see his blood doth mark our door, faith points to it, death passes o'er. The work that we celebrate here is not any work that we have done. And we don't merit any bit of grace 
by coming to this table. We simply come to celebrate the grace that God has poured in us. The gift that he has given in his son. The text that most directly deals with this, we look at often, is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul tells us what we're doing here. He says in verse 23, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We are here to proclaim and to celebrate the death of Jesus. When we, when we gather for the uh, a viewing or a wake or a funeral of a loved one, I've never been to one, I hope I don't go to one, where we're celebrating the death of that person. We celebrate their life. We share memories. We try to encourage one another. But their death does not bring any eternal value to us. This one does. This is the death that changes us completely for all of those who receive this as a gift of faith. Not this bread and this juice, but what it represents. The body and blood of Jesus Christ killed for our sins. If that is true, if that's happened in your life, we invite you uh, to, to participate with us. But it's not just for anyone, anytime, anywhere. It's a church function. So we ask if you're to participate, if you're a member of this church or if you're a member <clears throat> of another gospel preaching church. Or if you're in process of joining this church, then we invite you to celebrate with us. Let's pray before we partake. Father, thank you for the body of your son that was given on our behalf, the perfect lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Our bodies could never do that. Not by our life, not by our death, not by the best things we have ever done. It's all part of your work on our behalf. Thank you, Father, for your Son, for sacrificing him to pay for our sins. We ask that you would be pleased with this act of worship. In Jesus' name. Our Lord commanded, <clears throat> do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Father, thank you for the body and the blood of your Son, the payment for our sins, the forgiveness of our sins, and the, the grounds by which we can be adopted into your family. 
Father, help us to worship you rightly as we ought to for your unspeakable gift. I pray this in Jesus' name. As our Lord commanded, do this in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. What a joyous statement. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is one aspect of of that public proclamation. Another aspect is when we leave these doors and go back to our neighborhoods, our places of work, our families. The proclamation must not end there. It continues. If you don't know what to say, come back to this picture. Go to 1 Corinthians 11 and explain what our great God has done. As our tradition is here at our church, uh, we'll sing our closing hymn. Our deacons will pass our plates for a deacon's fund offering. Uh, you're welcome to give. We use this to help alleviate the needs of people within our church as the time, time and occasion arise. So if you would, stand with me and take your hymn books for our final hymn. Am I a soldier of the cross? Hymn number 421, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? We'll sing all four verses together. Let's sing. For our benediction today, consider what Paul said to the Corinthians, chapter 1, 20 to 25. He said, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, 
a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Go in peace, brothers and sisters, thanking God for his wisdom to save his elect, and assured of his power that his power will change you into the image of his Son and deliver you from the wrath to come. You are dismissed. Children, come show me your notes, your pictures.